Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Shot, episode 313, featuring the first in a two-part series of interviews with none other than Jordan Weissman, the creator of Battletech and Shadowrun. Uh, Jordan recently has made the headlines because the, his company Hairbrain Schemes is doing a, a Kickstarter project to spur development of their planned resurrection of the Battletech uh, computer game franchise. This will be a turn-based tactical game that looks completely amazing. Strongly suggest you go check out their campaign page if you haven't done so already. Anyway, we've got a lot of stuff to cover here. We'll uh, talk about the new game uh, in this segment. In the next segment, we'll get into the history of Battletech. So a lot of great stuff, so stay tuned. Anyway, got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Jordan Weissman. All right, folks, I am here with the great Jordan Weissman of Hairbrain Schemes. He's a living legend in the games industry with roots in not just computer games, but also uh, tabletop games and yeah, console games. He's a, even a pioneering figure in virtual reality, augmented reality, transmedia. I don't know what the guy has it done, to be, <laughs> to be frank. Uh, now he's bringing back Battletech <laughs> in a turn-based uh, tactical uh, mech game. This will be set, of course, in the Battletech universe. So how are you today, Jordan? I am well, Matt. Thank you for having me. And um, uh, it's always hard to, uh, to speak after, um, you know, being called a, a legend and great and old all at the same time. And, you know... <laughs> <laughs> so I think the old actually adds up to uh, why I've done so much. So, Well, it's been 19 years since you made a, a mech game, right? And I was wondering what made you want to return to this yeah. franchise. And uh, does this, what does this mean for the uh, Shadowrun series? Well, two questions in there. So the first is, um, it has been a long time since I made a mech game. Um, and uh, partially the, that's uh, because of the, the right situation with um, the, uh, the rights being held by Microsoft uh, and me not being there anymore, uh, you know, it was uh, not uh, not an easy thing to to go make a mech game. But I, I'm actually uh, thankful of the uh, of the of the break because um, you know, having I had been making mech games at that point for over ten years, and uh, it's it was really nice to step away, make new universes, really explore new you know new new styles of games, you know, kind of just really. Um, broaden out my experience and uh, and and refresh my energy for diving back into uh, to the Battletech universe. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm so excited to be working with the team and Mike McCain on on you know coming in and, and as well as some of the guys have been working in the mech games you know over the last decades with Randall and Lauren over at, at Catalyst and um, uh, bringing back Mike Sackville into the fray to to write some uh, some novellas. Uh, it's it's great um, you know. Working with a new team on BattleTech and and bringing back uh, elements of the of the uh, the old band back together as well, uh, so I'm totally excited about it. Uh, I'm um, I've always loved to tell stories in this universe, and I think the format of game that we're building to tell a great story, um, very focused on the single player campaign um, as a starting point. We're getting close to funding the open ended campaign, which is which is really one of my uh, one of the things I really wanted to do, so I'm so excited about that. Uh, and you know, and then to, you know, make sure that we're, we, uh, you know, it's fun to be able to get back together with the old gaming group and play multiplayer. So hopefully, hopefully, uh, you know, the campaign keeps going until we until we fund that that stage as well. Uh, in terms of what does it mean for Shadowrun? Um, well, we're, you know, we're, the team uh, is working on uh, Shadows of Hong Kong, which is the uh, mini campaign uh, expansion that was uh, part of the. Uh, Hong Kong uh, Kickstarter or, um, uh, in the beginning of the year, uh, and that will come out uh, in the beginning of next year, uh, uh, first of sixteen, uh, and uh, and then frankly there'll be a there'll be a gap there'll be a break there as as most of that team will come over and work on BattleTech and so there'll be you know probably about a year before uh, before we decide whether we are diving back in to do another Shadowrun or not. I have to say I'm I'm not as familiar with the tabletop. A BattleTech game as I am the computer games. I played. Spent a lot of time with Crescent Hawk, Inception on the on the Amiga. And then I played, of course, the Mech Warrior Two and uh -huh. all those games on on the land. Very different kinds of games. And I've had a, a Shane the Stacks actually asked this question. I wanted to. I thought this was a good question. Uh, will this? You know, how will it compare to those games? And are you going to go for something more complex with this? Sort of more like the. Uh, will this have a closer affinity? I guess to the. Uh, to the board game than the other computer games that are out there already. 
Um, well, it is it, it is a turn-based game, so we're going to be able to dive into a little bit more of the, the depth of tactics and strategy uh, than um, you can uh, in a real-time game, right? In a real-time game, you're... Uh, one, I mean, Battletech and Battletech Compact Combat just has an enormous amount of information. Uh, all the different areas that can take damage, and all the and all the components, and how they relate. Um, and a real time game, you you can't deal with that. It's just too much information. Even in a turn based game, uh, for a computer turn based game, a modern kind of turn based game, you, we are we have to be careful about how we expose that information in a way that doesn't become overwhelming. Um, but our goal is to uh, to to really allow you to get into more depth. Uh, of the management of your um, mechs and your mech warriors uh, than you have been able to do in a real-time game. Uh, and then, of course, the other big difference is the story, right? I, I go back to Crescent Talks, which you mentioned, which is really, in large respect, the last, um, you know, really deep storytelling Battletech game that was done on a, on a computer. Because, uh, you know, I think there was good stories that we wrote for, mech war for the Mech Warrior series, but your ability to dive into them is limited by you know, again, the interface, which is uh, is real time and tends to have you know lots of explosions, um, and so I think the, here we are. You know, it's not a full RPG um, like Crescent Hawks was, but it's a hell of a lot closer than we've been in in you know the twenty some odd years in between here, twenty five odd years since since uh, Crescent Hawks, I think. Well, the response has been really. Uh Really awesome. I mean, what what I saw that you had funded. You actually reached the funding goal within uh, fifty three minutes. So it didn't, it didn't even take an hour, I guess, for you to uh, to hit to uh, hit the funding level. Is that? I know you've done a bunch of other Kickstarters too, but were you surprised with this uh, result? Well, um, uh, we we were overwhelmed in in the uh, that we raised a million dollars in the first day. Uh, that was a fantastic response. the the uh, The two hundred first two hundred fifty thousand that that uh, that that is not really the funding goal for the game, right? Because Hairbrain Schemes was already putting in, you know, a great deal of money to make the base game. Um, so that 250 represented kind of the big first feature add to a game that was already uh, in uh, already funded for its primary development, uh, which is why that number is so low, right? I mean, these are expensive games to make. 250 thousand isn't going to make a game, you know. Um, but it does help add a lot of great features to a game, and and that's what this audience has been doing. They've been helping us take uh, what was going to be a, a really rich skirmish game, and we've now you know funded it uh, up to a single player campaign. And now we're just uh, hopefully today or tomorrow we'll we'll hit this, the open ended uh, single player campaign, and those are those are dramatically bigger and more interesting games than the ones that we were the one we could have funded internally by ourselves. I well, see the the last goal. I just checked it this morning. I don't know. Maybe you've already hit it, but uh, the voice acting goal has been hit. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts uh, yet about casting uh, for those roles. Um, well, yeah, we have hit the, the voice acting goal, and uh, and so there would definitely be voice acting uh, in the game for uh, recurring roles and uh, uh, and uh, kind of transitional scenes um, and some you know kind of key moments in the uh, uh, in in the kind of uh, uh, single player campaign. Um, it will not be, uh, and we've been careful to say, right? It's not going to be a hundred percent voice acted game. A lot of the, a lot of the interactions are still going to be text because, especially as we get into the open ended campaign, um, uh, you're going to meet hundreds of, of people, and it's going to keep growing, and, and a lot of it's going to be procedurally. Some of that will be procedurally generated, um, and so we can't have voice acting for all of that. But where we, what we want voice acting for is, is for the recurring characters, for your mech warriors on the field, um, and things like that. Uh, have we thought about casting? Um, no, we really haven't yet. I mean, there's been uh, a number of, of, of uh, really very cool um, fans who've reached out to us who are uh, voice actors um, who have said they'd love to be involved. And uh, and so, of course, we're going to follow up with them. And the fans uh, have, have recommended people who they think should be involved, and we'll, we'll follow up with that as well. But we're, we're way too early to have uh, kind of made any decisions on that yet. That's, that's really exciting. Uh, one thing, I, I was looking at some of your earlier interviews, and you'd said that you thought that product development and marketing should go hand in hand. And I was looking at thinking about your Kickstarter pitch for this one and how it has the, the backer missions, you know, which seems like a pretty innovative uh, way to, to go about that. I was wondering, uh, how, how's that working out for you with the, uh, the backing, backer missions? I think uh, I think they've been going well. I think the the players uh, the the the, uh, the backers have, have really helped spread the word uh, about the the the, back, the Kickstarter campaign, and and that's really helped the overall um, you know mission of of getting us to uh, the you know the each funding stage. 
Uh, I also think that people have been having a lot of fun with them. Um, the uh, uh, and, you know a lot of the the stories that were that people put out about their their favorite most memorable BattleTech moments um, and MechWarrior moments was was incredibly touching. And then looking at people's collections of memorabilia, you know, it just took me back. Uh, and everybody, I think everybody in the community was like, "Oh, I remember that when I was a kid." And um, and so seeing that kind of stuff has been really fun. Uh, We've got upcoming ones that are that are going to be about um, uh, you know looking at fan art because there's you know we've got 30 years of great fan art and we love people to share that and um, so I think it's they've been uh, both a good way of getting the word out and a good way of the community connecting with each other uh, you know about a shared passion for this game and universe. I was wondering if all this drama around the the Star Citizen and Chris Roberts and all that is that has that had any kind of effect on the Kickstarter? Uh, reception for your for your game? I don't think so. Um, you know, we're kind of operating on the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, you know, our uh, our game is a uh, uh, is much smaller, right? I mean, we're we're looking at, um, at a uh, uh, well, a much more small contained game. Number one, number two, um, we have a track record of having shipped four of these already for uh, four previous Kickstarters. Um, and um, and we say no a lot um, <laughs> to ourselves and even to our fans when when you know we get ideas or we're presented with ideas which would expand the scope of the project beyond what we think is a, a safe uh, a safe scope for our studio to execute. Um, so I think those things combined have, have uh, you know given the audience a lot of confidence in us and and so I don't think we've seen uh, a lot of fallout um, uh, from that. And I would think, too, with your track record for delivering on your uh, Kickstarter games. I mean, Shadowrun Returns is one of the first uh, Kickstarter-funded games that, that I'd played. It is kind of fun, though, to think about, right? What if you got, you know, $50 million in <laughs> Kickstarter pledges? What, what would you do with all that, you know, unexpected cash? Well, you know, it, it, I think different at different points in your life, you have different dreams, you know, and... Um... Uh, you know, I've uh, had the good fortune to be um, creative director of Microsoft when we launched Xbox, and so I got to be involved in you know some of the largest uh, game projects there were at the time, um, and uh, and so I I don't need that right now. It's not what I'm looking for. Uh, what what we love are smaller scale projects that we can um, execute really well on, and that we can ship pretty quick. Um, uh, you know, where this is an 18 month development, which is, um, a, in the scope of big video games, that's a pretty short development. Um, it'll feel long to all of us cause we all want the game very quickly, <laughs> but, but in reality, it's a pretty short development. Uh, and, and I prefer it that way because I think we learn more when we ship and then we get to go back and do it again. I mean, I'll, I'll point to Shadowrun as an example of that. Um, I mean, I think each of those games over the last three years have gotten better and better because we ship one, we learn, we do it again, we should, we, we learn, we make it better each time. Um, and uh, and I think you, you learn faster with your audience than when you're kind of just internally, you know, reflecting on what you're, what you're doing. Or, and what, so our studio kind of likes the idea of smaller scale projects. Uh, and we're kind of built around around that. So um, I don't know, uh, you know, if somehow we ended up with fifty million dollars, we'd probably pay everybody more because they deserve more than they're getting paid. But I don't know if I would <laughs> blow it up to be a giant game. Well, you mentioned that Shadow Run and BattleTech are very different games, and we're going to see that reflected in the combat system. I was wondering if you could elaborate just a bit more on that. You know, I'm just kind of wondering what what to expect coming to this from Shadow Run. Well, um, uh, I mean, they're both. Uh, Shadowrun is a a rich RPG, so there's a huge amount of conversation uh, that takes place in the game, um, and a uh, uh, tactical, um, you know, underneath that is a tactical combat engine, right? Uh, BattleTech is the opposite. It's going to be uh, first and foremost a tactical combat game, um, and uh, and then uh, a a rich story surrounding that. So it's it's really kind of a opposite priority levels. Well, I was gonna ask your opinion on something here. I, I ordered the uh, or I placed at the Noble House Cyan Cyan tier, oh, well, and it thank, had a, thank you very much. It, it had a choice of uh, banners, you know, for the different houses. And it's been a while. Yeah. I'm kind of out of the lure, and I was just wondering, uh, you know, what's your favorite house? Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> what, what should I go with there? I don't. 
Yeah, well, um, you know, I've been in the business a long time, Matt, and you can't fool me into that one. Uh, <laughs> that's like saying, you know, which of my three sons is my favorite? Oh. You know, I'm not, uh, not going to go there. I, I like each of the houses, um, you know, I mean, having written them all up originally, um, uh, each of them, I think, uh, to me, have a different attraction, you know. Um, and so uh, I, I don't think I would... I don't think I would uh, put my foot in it to say which one I would consider a favorite because because I love them all, you know. So it doesn't really matter which one I when I pick, and <laughs> nobody's going to come in and be well, like, I, I think can't it's believe a you which, have that banner. <laughs> it's a matter of which which one you know of the of their kind of general aesthetics uh, occur to you. I mean, obviously, you've got kind of uh, the Krita, which is much more of the Bushido aesthetic, you know. Um, you've got uh, Davian, which is kind of the uh, Northern European, uh, United States kind of uh, aesthetic and worldview, right? Um, you've got Lao, which is, um, you know, mostly of a, uh, of a Chinese um, kind of aesthetic and worldview. Uh, and, uh, and Merrick, uh, which is more of a Mediterranean um, uh, kind of environment and, uh, um, you know, Arabic, you know, kind of Persian, Persian environment. And then um, uh, and Steiner, who is, uh, you know, kind of um, the, the Lannisters of, uh, uh, of the uh, Battletech universe, so, you know, kind of very commerce driven, very monetary driven, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, very much live by the golden rule. So uh, uh, who's got the gold rules? Um, so I think it's, uh, you know, which, which of those kinds of, uh, of aesthetics and leaders, you know, kind of speak to you is what, which which house uh, would make sense to have on your wall. But thank you so much for backing us at that level. I appreciate that. No, I just, uh, that, I'm excited about the banner. That's, that's pretty cool. Uh, pretty cool park. And I think it comes with a cap too. Is that one? Yeah. Hat, patch, pin, dog right. tags. Well, the hat fit on my head is my question. I got a kind of a big head. <laughs> is the All right. Well, cap I'll, adjustable? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll work with Brian who, who heads up that for us and we'll make sure we, we, uh, we get one that'll work. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, there's a question from Paul Poussin. He was wondering, will the story involve Jason Youngblood? Well, that's an interesting question, um, uh, and obviously an old-time fan, uh, because that's not that's not a name you pull out of a hat. Um, you know, I don't I, not as a central character. Um, uh, we're creating, you know, kind of a new uh, a new group to be the central characters. Um, but we are going to uh, – we're designing the story such that uh, they will have opportunity to meet lots of people from, you know, kind of the, the pantheon of, of, uh, of the Battletech universe. So it's not uh, – it's not determined uh, but not, um, not unreasonable that, that he and Jason might cross paths. I'd have, to, I'd, I'd have to go look up, make sure Jason is around 3025 to be, to be sure, to tell you the truth because I don't remember that for sure. But, you know, we, we would check that first. Uh, here's a question from Emil. I, think, I believe this is Hammer or Hammer. It says, which style of music will you go for? Uh, Jian Huang in MW2 or something different? Well, um, we're, uh, I mean, I think we're, the, the composer we're working with is John Everest, um, who's worked with us on our Shadowrun titles. Um, obviously, the Shadowrun aesthetic uh, is quite different than the Battletech aesthetic. Um, uh, the same composer, John Everest, worked this on Golem Arcana, and we were able to uh, to find a very different uh, sound uh, for that game. Um, but I think uh, Battletech is an interesting one because it. it uh, and again, we haven't we haven't done this exploration yet, so this is just kind of you know thoughts from the top of our head, and it's not something that Mike and I had, and Mitch have really dove into yet. But I think it's it's an interesting one because it it. Um, it supports and kind of brings the aesthetic to mind of both, you know, classical in the sense of kind of like, you know, 1812 overture, you know, um, and, uh, but you could also, and we have in the past also, you know, integrated kind of more uh, heavy metal kind of uh, aesthetic in it as well. So I don't, I don't know where we're going to end up, um, but we're going to fun, uh, fun exploring it. So, but again, we're, we don't have that, uh, we don't, we don't have that nailed down yet. I did like the little sting that, that, um, uh, that John did for the Kickstarter. I thought that was, that had a kind of sense of grandeur to it, which is something, you know, that mechs need. Yeah. Now, he's also wondering if you would be willing to, uh, I don't know how, how, if this is even possible, but to get the old Mech Warrior and Mech Commander games up on GOG or Steam. 
Um, you know, the uh, the rights uh, of those are are a fascinating subject. I mean, just getting us getting the license itself was a fascinating, you know, exploration into into uh, licensing and rights. Um, uh, we are really working with Microsoft to to explore all sorts of options. Um, certainly, they own the rights to the Mech Commander games and to you know a couple of the Mech Warrior games, and they have in the past released um, you know source code on uh, on some of those games. Uh, you know, so it's not uh, it's not out of the realm of possibility. Um, it is something we we kind of have on our list to be con to talking to Microsoft about, but. Um, they're a big company with a lot of agendas and and uh, and you know this this stuff is pretty small potatoes to them, so it's hard to get you know hard to get the attention. Their heart's in the right place. It's just a matter of where to get the uh, get the attention and get the lawyers to get you know get things done. But uh, uh, so it's something you know we'd love to explore. But I, we can, we don't know if it's it's feasible yet. All right. So you want to shift into some more historical questions? Oh, we can else? try. I'm really bad at them, but yeah, let's give it a shot. Unless there's something else you'd like to say about the Kickstarter pitch or anything. Well, I mean, the biggest thing to say about the Kickstarter is to to thank everybody. I mean, both uh, the financial support and also um, just the outpouring of of uh, kind of excitement about the project and about the universe uh, uh, makes an old guy feel good about you know uh, having made something all those years ago that people still care about uh, and. Uh, and it's got us all really charged up to to go make a, a fantastic game. Um, you know, hopefully satisfying the BattleTech fans in a in a way like we did the Shadowrun fans, where I think we were able to, uh, um, you know, to uh, to do a pretty good job there. And and we want to try to do that or better, you know, on uh, on BattleTech. So the biggest message is just thank you for your support and, and uh, go tell your friends because we you know we got a couple weeks left and we'd love to push it up over uh, into the multiplayer uh, arena. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with part two of this interview series, and we'll get into the history of Battletech uh, there. And he's also, Jordan's also promised at some point in November, hopefully, to make a second interview uh, with me to talk about the Shadowrun stuff, which uh, we didn't get to in this, this round. But if you really want to know more about Shadowrun, just stay tuned. Uh, it will be coming up shortly. As always, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your support of Matt Chat. It means the world to me, guys. You have no idea how grateful I am to you. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that support. If you would like to uh, add in uh, your support to the Matt Chat production, just go to the link in the show notes to the Patreon site. A couple of minutes, a couple of clicks, a couple of dollars. It's all I ask, and I thank you very, very much. Now, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Quite a bit of exciting stuff. Our friends over at the RPG Codex. I guess they're friends over <laughs> Those guys over there at the RPG Codex. Oh, what the hell. My friends over at the RPG Codex have posted a link. Uh, they've done some research. Uh, it's really pretty cool what they've, what they've uh, managed to uncover here. Uh, I don't know what, if any of this is official yet, but basically what it looks like is happening is that In Exile is making a new Auto Duel game, rebooting the Auto Duel franchise. You might remember I covered that uh, way back and also had an interview with Chuckles. Uh, to talk about that game. So it's it's really an awesome oldie, and it's really cool. That I have no idea what they might be trying to do with this, but it's got a lot of potential. I always thought it was sad that more hasn't been done with that. So anyway, kudos to the RPG Codex for finding that out. Uh, let's see. In other news, Ed Greenwood, uh, the creator of the Forgotten Realms campaign setting, one of my favorite campaign settings, and I, I love the novels, the games, I mean, Forgotten Realms, come on. Anyway, Ed Greenwood uh, made an appearance on Shane Plays Radio. You know, Shane, uh, Stack's friend of the show. Uh, so I'll post a link to that if you'd like to listen to that recording. Uh, really cool. He's getting some high-profile guests on there these days. And finally, if you didn't get enough of Jordan Weissman, and uh, you'd like to hear from Mike McCain and just learn more about the Battletech uh, Kickstarter, uh, Adam Dayton has recorded another interview with him for Fragments of Silicon. I'll post a link to that 
Uh, so you can check that out. And uh, both Fragments of Silicon and Shane Plays Radio are should be pretty much required listening uh, for any fans of Matt Chat. Really awesome stuff with a lot of uh, crossover appeal for those of us who love this stuff. So what about that ale of the week? Well, this is a really weird uh, pick for this week. This is a rogue beard beer. <laughs> a beard beer. Beard beer. Okay, I think I made that clear. Uh, this is really weird. Basically what they've done is taken the yeast uh, from this guy's beard. Uh, this is uh, John Mayer. <laughs> And actually use that yeast uh, to brew the to brew this beer. Uh, it says here, what does beard beer taste like? Try it. We think you'll be surprised. <laughs> uh, so I thought they were joking about this, but uh, I guess it's legitimate. And they've really, uh, I guess they can make beer out of any kind of yeast. And you know, who who would have thunk it? Uh, ingredients: uh, water, hops, barley, and beard yeast. I'm just not actually little fragments of beard and little whiskers in here. That would not be cool. Uh, let's see: 14 degrees Plato, 25 IBU, 71 AA, 6, de 6 degrees L, whatever the hell that is. 4.8% alcohol, so not actually very strong at all. I think actually that's about uh, micro brew levels. Let's see: Oregon brewed. Oxygen fixing caps. Not sure. <laughs> For more information on the beard, follow the beard at www.johnsbeard.com. <laughs> Apparently, this beer has its own uh, website. It's pretty cool. Anyway, let's get this open and see what this beard beer is all about. All right, so I got some of this rogue beard beer here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I've been smelling it. It's a very sweet, very light aroma on this. It smells a little citrusy, kind of like a Belgian. Anyway, it smells really good. And I got to admit, too, I really love, love this concept of making uh, ale from somebody's beard yeast. It makes you kind of wonder what other uh, sources of yeast might be on the human body. I don't know if that's a pleasing or a disturbing thought. Anyway, let's give this a taste. Uh, this one is a very sweet, very light, very crisp flavor on this. Uh, actually, quite tasty. Uh, I'll try it again. I'm getting kind of a, it's mostly just the sweet that, uh, that I'm tasting here. It's, it's got sort of a Belgian y flavor, a little bit of a sort of that cereal uh, frosted flakes like taste you might get uh, with some of the lagers. It's actually a, it's, it's very nice. I'll try it one more time here. It's quite a good combination of flavors. It's kind of like a cross between a Belgian and uh, maybe like a Pilsner uh, flavor on this. Uh, but it's very uh, sweet tasting and very light. And you could probably drink this whole thing and not have any issues uh, since the alcohol content is relatively low. Uh, I'm going to go maybe three out of five drinking horns on this uh, beard beer. I would, I'm tempting it to give it a bump it up to four just because it's such a neat concept. And you'd have a lot of fun explaining the whole beard concept to your friends. <laughs> you know, what the hell are you drinking? That would be a lot of fun. But uh, taste-wise, I'm going three out of five on this one. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking uh, for quotations about gratitude and saying thank you. <laughs> I found this one from G.B. Stern, an English author. It goes something like this. Silent gratitude isn't much good to anyone. See you guys next week. And thank you. where it's always morning in America, even in the afternoon and noon.